Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all of our listeners. We are broadcasting this, our 10th episode of the non-existent story. Casey, now back from Spain and comfy cozy in, something popped up, in Chicago. I am still in Arizona. So we have our time changes, but they're back to their slightly less interesting rate. So, Extremely interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Uh, so today, Casey will be presenting her not just a story, and I will be providing very, very, you know, good, insightful commentary. So, vigorous to the point. Ask your tough questions. I will. I will. I won't stay away from those, America. You know I will ask. The <laughs> Be the questions. wolf blitzer <laughs> of our podcast. And Casey? <laughs> um. Right, so I want to incorporate, uh, there will still be kind of a Spanish theme here because I started writing this in Spain, although most of it was written today. Uh, but I want to use the, the fan as a kind of uh, segue tool, kind of like those little things they use between scenes to cut for movies. So the next scene, like so. I'm working on it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's the method great. has not yet been perfected. So the theme for today is the duel. Mm. These are two tales of duels, two very short tales of duels. Um, and I will begin with a vaguely Spanish theme, but it's kind of a universal theme. <clears throat> Carlos was heir to a great fortune, but unlike the vast majority of cases, his fortune was the least of his excellent qualities. Women adored him, his parents adored him, he had received a superb education and was a man of fine character and considerable talent. But unfortunately, the greatest difference between idiots and men of talent is that the former group is more likely to say stupid things, while the latter is, more, is far more likely to do them. Carlos entered society and soon enough, he fell in love. Carlos was a man of imagination and men with imagination require women who are either very sensitive or very risque. Adela was undoubtedly one of the risque types. Beautiful and quite aware of it, her parents had cultivated in her all the qualities that our society values. And society values the same types of qualities in a woman that in a rifle would be called range and in a hunter, skill. That is to say, they had raised Adela to be a perfect deadly weapon. At flirting, she could outdo anyone. Though not especially sensitive, she could still admirably fake the sentimentality without which it is impossible to conquer a man's heart. She sang beautifully, she danced like a fainting woodland nymph, and she gazed at you with the eyes of a dying victim. It was impossible. <laughs> what? <You> <laughs> <laughs> We may have to edit that. <laughs> oh, I just, I might be picturing something different from what the author intended with that. I don't know. It was impossible not to adore her. Oh, hold on. Let me write that down. I think I'm dying. dying victim. <laughs> For Carlos, Adela was the truth amongst lies, heaven on earth. Her parents were ecstatic. He was a brilliant match. And so that which, without the involvement of the state, would only have been a love affair, became instead a marriage. The transaction was complete. Six months into their marriage, social custom demanded a certain level of detachment, for society finds nothing as ridiculous as a man who is overly attentive to his wife. Adela, for her part, was more than entertained by the world and its abundance of delightful young men. Until at last, one young man proved impervious to her charms, and Adela, not accustomed to such slights, and now all the more determined to conquer, put her, put her virtue at risk, as the saying goes. Carlos had first suspected and later confirmed. There was a scandal, everyone knew about it, and society demanded satisfaction. Carlos had to give it to them. He challenged Adela's lover. The ground was chosen, the hour set, the signal given, the two shots fired at once and Carlos fell to the ground. But his honor and his woman remained standing. And now I shall read the excerpt, and in honor of Spain in general, and Seville in particular, where I recently was, quite briefly, I will be playing uh, the overture from The Barber of Seville by Rossini. Oh, good. <laughs> and we will all think about Bugs Bunny. <laughs> 
but <laughs> we'll also think about my excerpt. Mm. Yes. Um, before you play it, because ah, oh, okay. yes, yes. Um, um, before you play it, really quickly. Um, so there was a brief skip in the audio. And I don't know which which man hit the ground dead, Carlos or the lover. Carlos. 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 Okay. A worthy man was lost. Carlos is lost. Okay. Okay. And let me know if you can hear it. Okay. Mm. Good. Yes. Yes, I can hear it. In this, our enlightened century, one of the things that most obsesses the public is honor. And it, and it, <laughs> An enigmatic concept, in the sense which we currently use it, is not encountered in any of the ancient texts. The notion of honor is the child of the Middle Ages, and as our civilization has developed, honor has been refined and perfected along with it, to such an extent that these days there is not a single person who does not have honor of a sort. Every man is a man of honor. In ancient times, times of great confusion and barbarism, when a man who, by exploiting an advantage gained only through impudence or luck, humiliated someone else, he only humiliated himself, and without making a fuss about honor, remained himself dishonored. Now, it is the opposite case. If a low or vicious person offends you, you are the dishonored one. Someone slaps you in the face, everyone will sneer at you and not at the person who slapped you. Someone offends your wife, your daughter, or your beloved, you are the one who no longer has honor. Has someone robbed you? You, being robbed, are now poor and consequently without honor. The man who robbed you and now is rich is a man with honor. He drives about in your car and he is a decent man, a gentleman. You, meanwhile, now go about on foot. You are just an ordinary bastard with no car. Ah, the marvels of progress concept of this sort of honor. Ancient history does not contain a single example of a duel. When Agamemnon offends Achilles, Achilles enclosed himself within his tent. He did not go out and demand satisfaction. The duel, in relation to the history of the world, is an invention of yesterday. It has taken us almost 6,000 years to understand that when a man mistreats you, to make amends for the damage done, and that way is to kill him. And dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so end of story one, excerpt and summary of story one. Okay, one moment. Yes. How's your okay. uh, IPA? Is it delicious? It's, what are you drinking? I, it's it's like pretty mediocre. It's like the cheap one that I got from Trader Joe's, but I can't really hear myself with this headphone, so I feel like I'm. I don't know what I'm actually saying. <laughs> no this episode will be a surprise to both you and I. <laughs> I won't be able to guess. <laughs> Which one did I write? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it'll sound like the, the way people who are deaf talk a little bit, probably. Right. <sighs> okay. Um, story two. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Pablo was a man of small fortunes, but possessed an excellent figure, a lively conversation, and great ambitions. Thanks to these latter three qualities, he managed to marry well, to a woman whose teeth were as prominent as her social position. But the marriage proved intolerable, his jealous wife spying upon his every move. In a panic, Pablo left Madrid one night and fled to Tulelo, a city of impregnable traditions still locked in the Middle Ages. Within this fortress on a hill lived Pablo's estranged brother, Miguel. They had not spoken for a decade, but given the circumstances, Pablo was certain that Miguel would offer him asylum, at least until he could secure a post somewhere in the American colonies. Upon arriving in his brother's house in Toledo, Pablo was greeted by Miguel's wife, Julia. She called him Miguel. From the servants, Pablo learned that Miguel had died quite suddenly two months ago, leaving his adoring young wife, Julia, crazed with grief. In her insanity, poor Julia believed Pablo to be Miguel, returned not from death, but rather a long journey. At first, Pablo found Julia's delusion both awkward and grotesque. But having nowhere else to go, he remained. 
He soon discovered that, for a modern man like himself, free of old-fashioned scruples, there are certain distinct advantages to living with a beautiful, albeit demented, woman who believes one to be her husband, especially when that woman also commands a modest fortune. Best of all, Julia only required his attentions at night. During the day, she was completely indifferent to him, occupying herself instead with maintaining the household and attending mass, leaving him free to do as he pleased. Pablo was a sociable man, and eventually his fear of being discovered by his wife was eclipsed by his need to enter into society, or what passed for society in Toledo. One hot evening, after having imbibed one too many glasses or bottles, he made some remarks about Julia that suggested that he knew her more intimately than it is customary for brother-in-laws to know their sister-in-laws. The bar fell silent. A man at the table next to him stood up, paid his bill, and asked Pablo to choose the time, place, and weapon. I am Julia's brother, he said. Pablo had insulted his sister's honor, and he demanded satisfaction. When it dawned on Pablo that Marcos had just challenged him to a duel, he initially declined. There hadn't been any duels in Spain for ages, he said. But under the silent stare of the men at the bar, all of them sneering at him in their heads, he found he was more terrified of being thought a coward than of facing a pistol. To cover his lapse of courage, he feigned effrontery, loudly insisting that he was the defended one, that Marcos had slandered his sister-in-law, and he demanded satisfaction from Marcos. Both men would now fight for their sister's honor. An hour was agreed upon, neutral and level ground was named, and the finest pair of dueling pistols in Toledo were borrowed, cleaned, and loaded. As dawn broke, Pablo found himself, still drunk, standing on the riverbank, a 200-year-old pistol in his hand. From her window, Julia watched Pablo and Marcos count their paces. She smiled, gave thanks to God for his mercy, for deciding himself which man he would take and which one he would leave for her. It had been so difficult to choose between them. The handsome brother of her husband, of her, husband her lover by night, and Marcos, her adopted brother, and, for some time now, the secret lover with whom she shared the long siestas of the afternoon. When she saw the men turn and take aim, she too turned her back to the window. When the shots rang out and one man fell and the other felt relieved to be alive, Julia collapsed onto her bed, overcome by her own tremendous relief. The matter had been resolved honorably. Now there was no need to let her fate be decided by that word that everyone is obsessed with but can never explain or define, that most enigmatic of concepts, love. And now I'll read the excerpt, and it will be accompanied by something I will find right now. Um, it's actually not a song. It's a beat. It's a slowed-down beat of a what are called tangos in Spain, which is actually a different kind of tango from the tango of, uh, of Argentina. Mm -hmm. It's a dance, like a tango sevillanos, they're called. It's like a flamenco beat, but this is a very uh, slowed-down version. And then let me know how the volume is. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Good? You can hear? Yeah. Yes. Okay. People who come from the capital often find them in our town gruff and taciturn. They complain of our dismal conversation, equating slow speech with slow minds. But we are thinking all the time, always measuring carefully each word and its myriad interpretive possibilities before uttering it, intending, when we drink, to be more melancholic than loquacious. In our town, words have weight. If we say we will pay a man, we will pay him. We are not divine, we cannot, as our Lord can, see into the soul of a man. We must judge by appearances, we must judge a man by his words and his deeds, and it is to every man and woman's benefit and to the benefit of society, that those two things be the same thing and not contradict one another. Men are a fallen and degraded race. What then is to keep us from deceiving one another? What is to keep us from uttering malicious calumnies, insulting and saying disgraceful, vulgar, or idiotic things against our sisters and brothers? Only the knowledge that if you insult or slander one of your fellows, a person who is no less one of God's creatures than you are, if you levy accusations against a man or a woman, then you must be prepared to back your words with your life. A society of men without honor 
is a society of lies, and it will be ruled not by the wisest men, or the just men, or even the strongest men, but rather by the men who are the greatest liars. End. One moment. Oh, and then okay. I can do this. End of story. Yes. Fan. That was what I was waiting for, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I enjoyed both of these selections immensely, um, as well as the musical accompaniments to both. Um, and as you said, they were somewhat short, so I don't think that summaries of either in this instance for me are necessary. I tend to prefer doing that when I want to make sure I've captured everything. Okay. A, a handle on the structure of both of these stories. So you are now going into the genre or topic of the duel, which yes. is really cool and very dramatic and appropriate, as you said, because you are coming from Spain. Um, as well as a, a recurring theme, well, several several recurring themes, but of honor. So the you've offended somebody else and, and they must maintain their honor. And there's a little bit more, and, and both provide kind of a different philosophy or explanation of why that is. Um, so I, I, I thought that was pretty interesting. So in the first story with the uh, adored Carlos, the heir, and his wife Adela, the um, for why duels exist and, and what it is to have one's honor and the link between honor and dueling is uh, from how it's explained in the second story. So in the second well, story, well, yeah, no, no, I was just, I think um, the, at least when I, when in the excerpts that I was trying to, to isolate, you have um, the summary is the story and they're two different stories about kind of a front and honor, as you point out. And then, um, each excerpt kind of poses a defense or an attack. So the first story would be against, but very ironically, uh, while as the second story, the, the excerpt poses a, a defense. So I think that's kind of the way I saw them fitting together. So you have like, um, a, it, it, they are kind of in, in themselves a duel. One is against and one is for. Mm-hmm. So if you go beneath the surface in the story, as with any story that's good, you find that it's actually much more complicated, probably in both cases. Yeah, I mean, it has this little, um, there are different angles on social commentary, which were pretty interesting. Um, and, and they did kind of approach it from that same way of, of as threatened honor and being resolved by a duel and what that means and why. Um, and the tones were also kind of different, I, I suppose, because at least the parts that, that, that were excerpts, the, the tones I also found very interesting. So they're both what, in the, in the first person? Or is um, there well, so old? in the, the first one is a, um, the summary is in third person. Um, and then the excerpt is like this kind of generic first person plural, like our Right, our society, etc. So the speaker locates himself within that society, but is somewhat uh, detached at the same time. Um, and likewise in the second, but the second employs a device that is more common in like novels, where it's our town. So you'll find this in Dostoevsky and, and other people, where you have this sort of omniscient third person that represents almost a gossipy. Um, kind of, uh, it's, it's omniscient, but it's, it's located and it's like a, definitely a sense of like, this is our town and then there's this outsider. Um, but in the, in the longer, in like the original version of that, um, if, if there is one, um, the, it actually um, ends up being Julia's perspective but you don't find that out until kind of the end. Oh, so she's actually see. Julia who's talking, but when, when certain things are described, they're described as if she was just this insane person. Right, and I, I did love her character. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very happy to see that that was kind of how the, where the narration came from. Because the, when the story so, starts off, she's kind of, a, she's an insane woman, supposedly 
driven to insanity by the death of her husband and happy to have an affair or, or imagine that she's copulating, making love to her husband when he is in fact her brother-in-law. But then we find out later that she's actually, she's with several men, much men, much like the Lannisters do. <laughs> so there seems there Speaking seems a question of honor. <laughs> <laughs> so so she seems to be knowing quite a bit more about what's going on, more with it than and then initially uh, you would suspect based on the summary. Okay. Yes, Interesting. yes, which is uh, I think important because uh, with especially the older notions of honor, um, it. One's honor was offended if one's wife or mother or or daughter or sister was insulted because they were considered your possessions, you know? So, although there are instances of, uh, I thought this was fascinating, researching this topic a little bit, it's infinite. But there are, there are instances of, of duels between women. Really? They're called petticoat duels, which I think is a great that. <laughs> that is a wonderful term. But always, they're always noble women. They're usually, and it's usually over. One time it was because someone called someone else old. Another time it was because someone insulted someone's flower arrangements. <laughs> like, and then there's just things escalate, you know, and it's all kind of hearsay. Um, but it has a, well, I don't know, the, the issue of honor is kind of its own separate thing, but it has, it's, it's very masculine, but ultimately it has to do with how society perceives you. This is a topic which I found very fascinating and also relevant, although I wouldn't have originally thought I would consider the duel uh, a relevant topic. But what was a, a very recent story about a Walmart, of course. So there's, there is a, uh, a brawl or a riot involving some 30 people, customers uh, fighting each other in this Walmart, and the police are called and they break it all up. And it, the source had been, I guess, a group of high school teenage girls had seen a woman wandering around, and they were making fun of how this woman was dressed, like the dress that she was wearing. Mm -hmm. And someone else who was with the woman, I don't know if it was one of her kids or something, got offended by that, and they started fighting each other. It turned out everybody had a relative or something there, and the next thing you know, there's 30 people fighting in the aisles of this Walmart, and a man's head gets bashed open with a can of, like, beans or something. Oh, my God. So, That's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like quite a, it's like kind of a, a tribal feud going yeah. on. <laughs> More than maybe, well, duels are almost always um, solid, like singular events. And they were historically like, yeah, like the nobility who would do them. But um, mm -hmm. especially in like the 17th, 18th century, and they were, you know, then they were outlawed. But uh, so they would have to occur in like these kind of like nebulous places. So, for example, the duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, United States, um, mm -hmm. occurred around the boundary line between New York and New Jersey because no one really knew if it was New York or New Jersey. So it was kind of like, it was a way to kind of be on the, the peripheral because people knew about these things and demanded them, but they weren't technically legal. It was still considered like murder. Um, sounds but they like, kind of, it sounds like a, a site that a lawyer would come up with for a duel. I know, right? <laughs> like right here in this county, is not actually a county and they can just debate it for 20 mm -hmm. years and then no one will care. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, there, there are certain cases like, um, so the duel is, um, was very prominent in uh, Western Europe. Also Russia is a big deal. Russia and Poland, the places like that, um, especially among nobility. Uh, and the American South, which um, was one of the last places the actually to see. The West, we, when you have the, the shootout, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. like that, that's like the, I mean, that's what the, the, the sharpshooters are. They're not the sharpshooters. What are they called? The, what the are gunslingers? They? Yeah, gunslinger. The gunslingers. The gunslingers are, 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 mm -hmm. are duelists. And they're just like they were men but with swords. So French prefer, preferred the swords. In England, they preferred pistols. And there's a very interesting case um, in which Uruguay in the 20th century re-legalized the duel. And it was legal in until the 70s, I want to say. So the 1970s, it was legal to kill a man who had insulted you at, in a duel. I mean, not like kill him in the back. Like you have to face your, your enemy, so to speak. Right. So well, I, yeah. That's it... thing. But it all has to do with this question of honor. So if you, uh, if you believe in honor, then you might see some value in it. And if you don't, you might just think that these are 
you know, two idiots and then someone dies over something stupid, like in the case of, of Carlos in the first one where you have this great guy who has all these things to offer the world and he's super talented and because of this shameless hussy, as it were, uh, and having to defend her honor when she had been the one to lose it. Because again, you know, it's she being a possession, uh, he has mm -hmm. to, uh, to lose his life. Whereas in, you know, in the second one, there's this sense of like, um, there is such a thing as honor and the, the idea that you, you back up your words and you don't speak light, lightly and you don't hide behind anonymity and uh, things like bravery and, and meaning what you say and stuff like that. Yes, but th th this is presented by a woman who has nothing to lose by the results of the duel. Uh, either way, she wins. So she would, of course, want to present it in a very, very positive light. And it's true. also the case with Adela uh, in the first story. Uh, it seems that no matter... It's, it's quite the gamble for the men involved, but the, the women in question are going to win regardless. So, Yeah, because in a way, I guess I, they're absolved by... That was kind of the thing that emerged in both that I didn't really see until we're talking about it now, is that when the duel takes place, the question of honor is resolved. And so there's, unlike some notion of like sin, where it's a personal thing and you're responsible, um, once it's been publicly resolved, you are absolved of your flirtation or your double flirtation or your incest or your, your double weird, almost incest. <laughs> <laughs> People who are almost your brothers, though neither technically is. It sounds like a very bizarre town in the second one. Toledo. So, no, I, I had no idea. It, well, it's my what imaginary passes, Toledo, but yes. Yeah, or, what, or what passes for society in, in the second town, according to Pablo. Yeah. Well, I mean, Toledo is interesting because, like, I, like, I did go there for a little bit. And, it, I mean, I don't know a lot about it, but it, it is a very conservative town. And it still looks like something out of game of thrones you know it's it's a, it's kind of a fortress on a hill and it has a giant church and and everything so it's very spanish no it sounds very cool it makes me want to visit spain definitely oh, for, for all the jewels and infidelity <laughs> well so that we can uh discuss these more in depth because i had no idea how endlessly kind of fascinating this topic was i i, I think that first i will try to guess which one of them you wrote um, I think I have a handle on it, but so so we shall see. Um, I would say because of the distinctions in tone or uh, approach to honor between the two stories, because in the first story the tone was kind of uh, self-deprecating and and ironic, uh, and also had my favorite line: "The eyes of a dying nymph." <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, as opposed to the second story, which worked really well with the music. When you read the excerpt, it was it made me think of someone telling jamming poetry in the '60s in a dark room. Um, <laughs> a little bit, yeah. But it, yeah, but it, it also it seemed to have more of a tone of self speculation than self depreciation. That and what I think I know of your your writing tendencies i'm going to say that you wrote the first one and not the second I, one i wrote the second one. Oh man yes but no i'm fine because i was gonna be i, I need to be you're still all right so you're still by by one um but uh yes i mean i, I chose and translated uh, I, I I do like that advantage especially with the Spanish because I translate it and that makes it easier to appropriate a little bit um, but I wrote the second one uh, oh, man. and the first one is oh my god it's uh, yeah the, I mean I'm glad that I'm really flattered actually because I think that some of the descriptions I thought were so funny and I was like this is too good for me to write but at the same time I can't not it was hilarious. It. so no I, I thought it was totally no, the, the the, the society that values the same types of quality in a woman that in a rifle would be called range and in an honor skill. They'd raise her to be a de deadly weapon. And that she danced like a fainting woodland nymph and she gazed at you with the eyes of a dying victim. <laughs> Oh, I, yes, I did love that. Wait, so, 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 like, so, I feel like, like, how do you, like, even ever say that? Like, <laughs> I imagine if, like, Shrek 2, Puss in Boots, you know how he stops and he puts his hat in his hands. Oh, and, the sword, and his, 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 his eyes just get really big. 
and the men are running after you, trying to kill you, and they stop, and they're like, oh. oh. And then he whips well, out also, a sword. And <laughs> that, like, with the, one of the things with the fan, and here I'll bring out the fan, is that you could use it to, like, communicate. So, like, there's different things. Like, this means I will never forget you, or something like that. Uh, as opposed to poking yourself in the eye, which I almost just did. Uh, I don't know what that would mean. <laughs> and then you can like glimpse over and do things. So I, you, you have to imagine that she's like gazing, but like over a fan with the, which I can't do the, the, I don't know. I don't have eye makeup on. Requires, they, they practice that from childhood on. So they've mastered it by the time they're, exactly. they're well, I, hunting for a husband. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so the first one is by um, a, kind of a, well, he's kind of a friend. A friend of mine in Spain uh, told me about him. He's like, I am this man, basically. And he introduced me. <laughs> and here's the book cover, but which I don't know if you can see. But his name is Mariano Jose de Lara. And he was born in Madrid in 1809. Mm -hmm. And he died quite young in 1837. He, I, he killed himself, actually, over um, a love affair that went bad. So frequently you see this sense of like how dangerous women are in his stories and it turned out to be quite true in his case unfortunately but so he was only 27 but he wrote an enormously amount of not enormous but like very good stuff so quite satirical mm -hmm. he's always being shut down by the the spanish press which was quite conservative but he has these ser these series of um articulos like little articles about society um that are quite ironic and really funny. So in this one, you know, he goes on this long prelude about how we've attained perfection and progress and our civilization. And he always says this, but it's so it's so deeply ironic. So for, like in the one in this part that I yes, in this our enlightened century, um, in ancient times, times of great confusion and barbarism. You know, so he always says these things, but it's it is uh, it is quite ironic. Yeah, that's the other reason I was so sure that you'd written the first one because of the 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 references to to the ancient Greeks. I was like, ah, oh, that's well, totally got to be her. And now I, mean, I know you did that on purpose. <laughs> Well, I mean, it fit really well with the, with the, I think we always end up having some sort of continuity, I think, which is yeah. interesting. There's like a leapfrog effect. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, yeah, so I, um, yes, I was inspired to include that section um, after uh, the last <sighs> tour de force through the ancient yes. world. Yeah, led me around by the nose the whole time. Uh, well, you, uh, but you call me on something, so I have to get trickier. Mm. Uh, and I realized that. You can only change one. You can only change your style so much. Like, it's true. This there's is true. there there are limits that are that are hard to break. Um, but yeah, and so what, when he tells it, he tells the the Carlos story in first person. But Carlos is a friend, mm -hmm. so he he says, you know, my my friend, like things like that. Um, but yeah, the part I think about like how honor actually works is really interesting because in Spain it's a huge topic, but there's also this sense that money always trumps it. So really. It was kind of like a way of only the nobles had honor historically and to be honorable was associated with being rich until eventually you get this sense of well like if you are rich you are honorable and how the whole thing kind of like turns itself in on its head which is which i think is i mean even though the u.s has kind of different notions of honor historically this idea that the person who gets away with things and who's kind of uh savvy and and maybe underhanded is still somehow more admirable kind of sticks <laughs> it's still persistent. Oh, also, side note, fun fact: uh, mm. the last known duel to be um, observed, it was illegal, but it was discovered, uh, was in 1992 in Louisiana. Really? Yes. So when we were but we once, there were still duels in Louisiana. Those was it? Were they Cajun? Was it a duel between a man and a crocodile? <laughs> were they raging Cajuns? <laughs> was this on Swamp People? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, because it's such a macho thing, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, maybe it's. I don't really feel like I. That's people get offended all the time, but yeah. So the last one, at least, at least on Wikipedia, the last one, it's a very diehard thing. I mean, just think about like. I don't know, uh, Gone with the Wind or something. They're, they're knights. It's a medieval thing. It comes yes, from well, the joust. I think so. perhaps perhaps it should come back because <laughs> people are offended now so easily. I would think that if there were real percussions to expressing your sense of offense, perhaps they would be a little bit more reserved in giving it. This is what I'm saying. That's kind of what I was trying to – I mean, it has a religious tone that I wouldn't necessarily – 
back, but what I was trying to do in the second story was come up with a situation or a defense that would make sense, like a rational defense for something as irrational as, oh, you insult me, sir. Let's one of us die. And then you realize that. <laughs> and so the thing, what I come up with is if, if you have to back up your words with actions and, you know, stand your ground, then that could be kind of a good thing for everyone. I agree. So I think that you've, you've convinced me we should bring back uh, duels, <laughs> not with pistols, with semi-automatics. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's not no there's all these things like for example like there if they if if both men fire and they both miss then sometimes they could fire again but they would never do it more than three times because then everyone felt ridiculous <laughs> this ever is just a terrible shot involved actually the thing about <laughs> duels and i know very little about them um is is the what i always thought was really interesting is the concept of seconds so you so you could end up, if you were chosen as, as a man second in a duel, the, the exchange of, of, of honor, insult, and injury has nothing to do with you. But you have to be there in case one of the people doesn't show up because they chicken out, and then you've got to take their place. I had the impression that's also how it worked because I was looking up, well, first of all, I looked up like why, what it was a dueling pistol and what makes it so different from other pistols mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, but then I was like, what, what does the second do and how does that work? And could woman be seconds? Because at one point in the story, I was going to have her be the second for both of them and they both think that they're, but uh, then I was like, oh, this is going to be complicated to explain in the summary. Um, but uh, when, uh, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> our only source of information oh. ever. <laughs> God bless Wikipedia. Wikipedia you know these hoodies? I should get one. The Wikipedia, Wikipedia hoodie. Oh, I know, right? Like, just like, mm -hmm. speaking of marketing, so here, let me show my, I love podcasting. It's a speaker on it, too. So, mm -hmm. anyway, it's been something like that, but for hashtag Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. But um, the seconds, according to Wikipedia, uh, were mostly in charge of trying to keep things bec from becoming a total bloodbath and for exchanging messages. So, like, usually these things, some people are really drunk, and then someone says, like, oh, your sister, and the guy's like, dude, I'm going to kill you. And then everyone's <laughs> all like, upset. <laughs> it's, you're going to kind of, well, I mean, you've been around for, like, drunk soldiers to probably imagine how these things could go. I've, I very rarely do I see them get upset about women. It's actually usually something else. <laughs> how dare you insult my prowess in Xbox 360. I will kill you. <laughs> I mean, no, no more absurd than the, than the duels over calling you old or the flower arrangements. <laughs> um, those are petticoat duels, but for men. Um, but uh yeah so the second would kind of like try to like calm them down they would help choose the the weapons they would deliver a message so usually it like you it would have to be at dawn mm. or even at night so there was actually in france where they preferred the sword um they would fight duels at night because it was illegal and they would usually go to what is it called the, i have it up here on my mouth one second the Bois de Boulogne or something like that, which was like right outside the city, again, the jurisdiction. But because they did them at night, um, they fought holding a lantern in one hand. So you have your sword like this, and then you held a lantern. So there's pictures of this, and in fact, there would be training manuals on how to fight with swords while you're also holding a lantern. <laughs> That's an incredible image. I, I, I need a picture of that now. You should paint that. a picture of that. I think that would be cool. That would be really cool. Oh, and then, well, maybe, or I can try to paint one. Um, my, my free time. And, but, uh, do, yeah, so seconds would do that. Um, but it doesn't talk, at least in that article, about, or let's say, like, so-and-so, like, chickens out and doesn't show up. Like, does the second then go and risk his life? Because that's kind of what I imagined, that right? was a, That had always been my assumption. Um, yeah, so that's something that I would need to like investigate a little bit more. But uh, yeah, I was I was curious about that. And then the dueling pistols. I mean, there, um, the the idea is that you don't want anyone to have a technical advantage, so they have to be identical guns, um, in which no gun is somehow superior or better. So just because you're rich and you have more money doesn't mean you can buy a better gun. They both have to use the same pistols, and they yes. usually would have like one shot or like three shots or something like that. So. Uh, and, you know, they're quite elegant, like the whole, the set and stuff of dueling pistols is, I think, it, cool it's, looking. No, it is, it is very cool. It is really yeah. groovy. 
Yeah, but uh, you know, it's it's like a, it's a, it's a really cool uh, theme, I think, because of the the ambiguity of the word and how much it has to do with how other people define it. Uh, the word honor, you know, because you don't really duel over anything else. You would resolve anything else legally. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, now we have notions of slander and libel, and you can sue someone for that. So we've kind of like replaced it with suing, I suppose. Well, I suppose if you if you make it illegal, you've got to provide some other manner of recourse that is legal, um, that maybe satisfies that. Yeah, yeah, a but similar, I, although less satisfying function. But I mean, it's pretty intense to like think like because I mean, you could be quite close, and the other person has like a gun right aimed at you. There are sometimes like where people would sh miss on purpose, kind of, and there's a term for that. But if you got a reputation for doing that again, then people would you know you could lose face in society. So it all kind of has to do with um, at least in the first one, he's really he blames society for everything. <laughs> Uh, quite uh, quite convincingly. Uh, he was very, very disparaging of Spanish society, probably with reason. I mean, it's a very conservative, Catholic, kind of backward, so to speak, country. I mean, he was mostly in Paris. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of, he saw, you know, he kind of like viewed things with like much more criticism. Um, but I... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, there's I, a friend of mine did a her dissertation on the duel in the 20th century. I've always been a little jealous. So I think that that's, is really cool. That's such I, a cool thing. Mm -hmm. No, I I'm very glad that you chose this topic, and now it leaves me only to figure out what topic I will choose for our next week's episode. Ah, uh, yes, and then we'll mm -hmm. be switching to to briefer or to uh, not briefer, less frequent. Yes. Game presentations so to speak Indeed. uh well i will we will leave it there this will be a shorter episode i guess yeah how long, how long do we go like 40 minutes oh wow well they were they were short stories of a similar theme so it allowed yes. me to be a little bit more um condensed than i would normally i normally ramble much more than this <laughs>